Ladies and gentlemen, my dear young friends, I am extremely happy to be here today. When uh, Srinivas came and met me about a month back and requested that I should give a talk. So after a little bit of thought, I gave a title. So there are three components to the title. I want to remind you that because I want to talk about that. First part is contemporary relevance of Bhagavad Gita. People ask, what do you mean by that? Because there is this widespread feeling, Bhagavad Gita has no contemporary relevance. That's why I have chosen a title to say Bhagavad Gita has huge contemporary relevance. To make it absolutely clear, I have given a subtitle also, Yesterday's Solutions for Today's Problems, to, to give a sense of what contemporary relevance one can expect. What I am going to talk today is not true of just Bhagavad Gita alone. It is true of the entire ancient Indian wisdom. As a sample, I have taken Bhagavad Gita today. So don't uh, have this impression that what I am saying is true of only Bhagavad Gita. Ancient Indian wisdom has huge contemporary relevance. And here is a society, such a strange society, which is just kicking it into the drain without knowing what it is. So I will make a very small attempt. I do not claim to be a scholar, but I certainly claim to be a very serious student of ancient Indian wisdom. I have for the last 15 years thinking and thinking, writing and lecturing on this theme. So let me bring that benefit and share. I am not claiming any expertise on this subject, but certainly I have ideas to tell you that uh, we have a huge uh, you know, treasure in front of us and for some strange reasons we have chosen to just ignore many of the things. Today I am taking an example of Bhagavad Gita. Maybe on another day it may be one of the Dasha Upanishads or Brahma Sutra or Bhagavatam or whatever. I am just taking Bhagavad Gita as an example today. Let me start with today's problems because I think that's what brings us into a little bit of uh, uh, interest to the lecture. Now if you want me to, dis to, to describe what is today, today's scheme of things, I think in a nutshell I must say that we live in a very interesting world of duality. It is not the Dvaita that I am talking about, we really live in a world of duality. I do not know how many of us think about it. That's a very apt way of describing today. Now, if you ask me what is these dualities? We have income levels going up. Even for a government employee, sixth pay commission and fifth pay commission, there is no, there is no even, uh, you know, connection. So, sixth pay, you know, salaries are much higher. Income levels are going up. There are more vehicles on the road. One advertisement, one advertisement says more car per car also. So, we have more cars, more gadgets. More malls, now you have this Meenakshi mall here to create a little bit of traffic jam here, right? So on one side of this duality is there is more schools, more education, more uh, courses, more, you can keep adding a list of more, right? This is one side of the duality, where it appears that uh, we seem to be progressing. This is the definition of progress, in fact I want to challenge this definition of progress. And I am not saying that, you know, having more educational opportunity is not progress. But the way we have understood this is where the problem is. So I would like to challenge the notion of progress. Anyway, so we have progress. That's what uh, intellectuals and think tanks write in papers, in magazines that India is progressing. And what does it mean? More traffic jam. You can, in IA in Bangalore, night, 10 o'clock, I am not able to take a right turn. That's the measure of progress for me now. I can't drive my car out of IIM Bangalore at night 10 o'clock, whereas it was possible in 90, 92 when I was here. In 87, the b b elephants will come and trumpet near IIM Bangalore. You may not believe, some of you might have been living at, at that time here. Elephants were blowing the trumpet and we used to hear that noise here. The wildlife was here. Anyway, that's not progress. Now we have progress. More uh, traffic jams, more uh, potholes, more roads. Anyway, that's one side of the duality. The other side of the duality is something which we seem to be ignoring, we seem to be not bothering about. India is the diabetic capital of the world. 
please understand india has the largest number of people who have contracted diabetes and hypertension the age group of 20 and 30 i do not know whether we should beat our chest and say you know i am very happy i have no idea right india has huge health issues in front of us right there is one girl who goes to the utility building and jumps from there because she did not pass 12th standard this is not part of this culture if there is one issue in bhagavad gita which i will talk about a little later is the greatest contribution of indian wisdom is how do you take life life has plus and minus today our kids don't know even many of our age group also don't know either you have to party or you have to go to psychological counseling there is nothing in between it looks like either you party or you go for psychological counseling i don't understand what is going on here we are we know only the two ends of the continuum real life has a continuum there is not only two ends right so you have more of uh, mental stress quality of working life is bad what salary in fact a month back or two months back front page in in deccan herald there was a nice article it says know your perks in in that article in know your perks it was not uh, the, it's not just the ctc caste company it said hypertension this there was a long laundry list they said these are all your perks that's what we have got today in addition to you know the salary and these kinds of things so the other side is i do not know what is happening to the quality of life people are stressed right from the kids to the elders are stressed we are hugely challenged as you turn medical improvements are there on one side science is developing on one side but there are counter effects which are happening on the other side so in a nutshell if you ask me what is today's problem today's problem i can talk for 3 hours and i makes a very pessimistic lecture i am not going to do that i just want to remain that uh, while there are material progress there is a lot of material progress in the last 20 years i am seeing i don't know to before that but certainly in the last 20 years so much material progress that 1 kilogram of uh, you know ladies finger must cost 40 rupees and not 10 rupees that is material progress you pay 40 rupees uh, jolly well and buy 1 kilogram of uh, ladies finger whereas you used to pay 5 rupees or 10 rupees 25 years back so material progress is there but along with that we have inherited a few things and the crux of today's problem is life is challenged i don't think any one of us actually disagree on that it's very stressful on an average you know going out is very stressful getting an admission for a child is stressful getting uh, you know uh, things done right i used to wonder this city i have been watching this city for 21 years right and it is true of all cities i am not saying only bangalore in india particularly we got urban development and progress completely wrong we have understood the notion of progress completely wrong you know in bangalore and it is true of madras it is true of bombay it is true of calcutta wherever you go three constituencies don't matter for cities development and progress first constituency is children below the age of 5 nobody bothers about them that's not part of development you go to a western country that is the meaning of development is different there children below 5 years nobody nobody bothers pedestrians is nobody's business if you have courage please walk from here to i am bangalore first you have to find a way of walking no i i walk from i am bangalore up to the jd mara junction but i i recite vishnu sahasrama when i walk because there is no place people ride on the small little uh, pavement also is this a sense that we are developing in this society pedestrians are nobody's business children below 5 years is nobody's business we lost in our family a 5 year old child was crushed by the school van in front of our eyes it happened in 2003 you might have read it in the paper my brother's daughter i, I was witness to it this is what we mean to run schools and uh, you know take care of children and and doctor said this girl since she fell he said up to the age of 8 or 9 children don't develop instinct to even put their hand she fell like a, a coconut being broken in in a prayer temple she fell like that and even after she fell the school went run over her in front of our house this is what development is this is how we actually have understood progress the third constituency which nobody is bothered about is senior citizens nobody bothers about senior citizens what society are we trying to build here who is going to worry about all these so this is not progress if you think this is progress please 
question yourself what is the meaning of progress so there are a whole lot of problems i am not going to get into the problems all that i am saying is we live in a world of duality on one side there are more of more of more of something there are other side there is more of more and more of bad things also so you there is no balanced perspective of what we should look for so this is the kind of issue that we have to take organization i am a professor of management i i read a book in 1997 there was a book written called the living company it's a wonderful book written by an executive director of shell this man had a simple question he said why would companies live long the first question he asked was will companies live long so our our life expectancy is 78 years or something they are saying it has gone up by another 2 3 years or something something his question was will companies live long so he did a research he wrote a book from the first page of the book i want to quote a couple of you know uh, information that he has provided he said one third of fortune 500 companies of 1970 did not exist in 1980 they are so unfortunate yet we call them as fortune 500 companies one third of fortune 500 companies of 1970 did not exist in 1980 they were bankrupt and they are gone second 40% of all new companies that started right collapsed within the first 5 years this is called infant mortality you know there is something called infant mortality you know when you design something first few years uh, first few times it may not work then maybe design problem it will collapse even child that's called infant mortality so he said 40% of companies will die within 10 years his, his research showed that i thought uh, this is very bad you know we have seems to have life expectancy we have infant mortality rates are okay 40% of companies are dying we don't even know abc or management we are running iims anyway that's a different story which we have to talk separately but anyway then third he said he said workers on an average managers in companies are hugely stressed there is too much of stress there is conflict there is this uh, you know fight for uh, this thing quality of working like the book goes on like that so personal life is not only challenged our professional life is challenged today so what progress are we talking where is the missing link so these are some of the issues there are many more of them i can branch into any of them and talk about i am not going to do it all that i am saying is there are few, too many problems but i have chosen today to talk about only three problems and solutions for them a little bit from bhagavad gita the three are first of all we do not seem to have inner character and strength that is missing otherwise this nobody will go to the top of here and fall from there and commit suicide the suicide levels are increasing right what we need to succeed in life is not positions or car or 60 40 flat none of them we need to develop inner character we need to develop inner character so the question is how do we develop inner character that message is missing today that's the central one of the problem i want to talk about a little bit and that manifests in many different ways people are stressed they get to go to psychological counseling i mean i have to laugh at it in this society if you have more psychological counselor that means we have it's a shame on indian culture indian culture's greatest contribution is psychology human psychology which we have now deserted because we are not reading any of these texts anyway i will come to that we abuse nature like anything right it's a huge issue today i went in another occasion i went and talked about only nature some college students were invited and i went and talked about only nature i said how ancient indian wisdom has wonderful ideas on nature i talked about it and we have missed it in bhagavad gita there are beautiful shlokas which actually reminds us some cardinal principles of how do you have to live in a very sustainable way that's another problem that we are facing i want to touch upon it a little bit the third thing which is very common place is what is called drudgery of work we are now fast inheriting this concept called weekend getaway you have to get away in the weekend because work is boring 800 years back in the dictionary the word boring was not there today's dictionary has the word boring boring according to me is spiritual emptiness if you are spiritually empty you will be bored if you are not spiritually empty you will never be bored i have seen some of the best greatest souls in life god has been kind to me there is one hospital called arvind eye hospital in madurai i have met the dr venkata sami at the age of 87 his hand used to be like this at the age of 27 he was discharged from army because he could not even stand arthritis doctor he was discharged because he could not even stand he didn't know what to do he was sent back 
he went and worked in a government hospital at the age of 59. After he retired, he started what is called Arvind Day Hospital, which is world famous today. Harvard Institute of Medical Sciences, John Hopkins, people are queuing up there for uh, internship. I have spent time with the doctor. Doctor passed away two years back. At the age of 87, with this hand, he has done one million cataract operation. In July, he slipped into coma. He came out of coma and did a few hundred operations before he died. Another five weeks. That is called no spiritual emptiness. You'll never feel bored. If you feel bored, that means you have spiritual emptiness. My own feeling. Please bear with me if I, if I meant anything else. What I mean is, what is this drudgery of work? Krishna has beautifully put a few concepts about work. Because it's after all karma yoga. Which is a major component of Bhagavad Gita. So I want to touch upon this. How much time? I do not know. But I'll touch upon some of this. Before doing that, I want to talk about Gita a little bit. Because I can't cover the 18 chapters in 45 minutes. Obviously. Right? Bhagavad Gita is one of the greatest contributions in ancient Indian wisdom. And that is why we have a concept called Prasthanatraya. In our old themes, there is this uh, certification mechanism. If, if Shankara came and said Advaita, if Madhva came and said Dvaita, Ramanuja came and said Visishta Dvaita, or anybody proposed a new idea, it will be accepted if and only if what they propose is not in conflict with three primary texts. It's a prasthanas, three prasthanas, prasthanatraya. And what are those? Brahma Sutra, ten Upanishads, Dasa Upanishad and Bhagavad Gita. So that is the position for Bhagavad Gita. If somebody learns Bhagavad Gita, it is as good as learning Upanishads and Brahma Sutra. Actually, everything is contained there. They say it's one of the prasthanatrayas. It's such an important text. Unfortunately, we do not know. Oppenheimer, who exploded atom bomb, knew it. In 1945, when he exploded atom bomb, when he saw the light, he quoted from Vishwarupa Darshan. Right? Sahasra Yukapak Darshan, you know, Basa Sadrishi Sad Basa Stasya Mahatma. He quoted that shloka. He said, The light I see reminds me of that Bhagavad Gita shloka in which Sanjaya says, In Vishwarupa, it looks like 100 suns are rising at the same time. That's the light I see. And Oppenheimer said, when I first saw the first atom bomb being exploded, I am reminded of that shloka. He is a great Gita scholar. Oppenheimer. So he quoted that. Many of us don't even know that. That's the situation we are in. Greatest Einstein is a great scholar. He is a great uh, singer of Bhagavad Gita. Greatest scholars in Europe, scientists, have been inspired by Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita has received the greatest number of Commentaries. Every leader in India, Balagangadra Tilata has written Gita Rahasya, two volumes, you should read it. Andy Besant has written, Arabindo has written, everybody has written commentary on Bhagavad Gita because Bhagavad Gita is so central to inspire individuals. You don't have to read for somebody else's sake, please read for your own sake. Bhagavad Gita has so much to inspire. So it has received the largest number of commentaries also. Yeah? It has a great. Uh, In fact, at the end of the day, if you ask why it has been so, you know, appealing to people, see, I was the editor of a journal for about five years. I wanted to, one day there was a thought in me, I wanted to come out with a special issue on high performing organizations. As a management school, you know, these topics are very important. So I was wondering what is this high performance organization, how, how can we get motivation and so on. Then there was a thought, this, this thought was there for a couple of years in me. I have been thinking about this issue. Then came this. I asked, how easy is it to put the greatest people in the society in front of you? Most credible people, right? Your teacher, right? Your grandfather, your uh, 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 uncles, and your, uh, you know, Sambandhinas uh, Tata. That's what in Bhagavad Gita, first chapter he says. Suhridayascha, people close to your heart. Senior, Ubayar, Madhye, on both sides, it, the problem is not only Pandavas were facing, everybody was in this. Yet, to put all of them and shoot them, you need phenomenal amount of clarity of thought and motivation. Otherwise, you, this is the toughest job. How many of you can tell me, how, can, how many of you can kill your teacher for whatever reason? You will say, no, that's what Arjuna does in chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Bhagavad Gita, you should read, the greatest uh, warrior who is praised like anything is falling like a pack of cards and I sympathize with him. Because, you know, he is a victim of situation. He says, my, you know, uh, uh, skin is burning. Because to kill all these people is not easy. Which is what happened. In between those two events, what happened? Bhagavad Gita. So then I said, maybe there must be something there. Some vitamin is there. 
some kind of injection is there which has motivated these people to go. It's not easy to do it. How can I kill? What would be the reason? How can I kill my grandfather? For some reason, they are on the wrong side. But how can I kill? I mean, I will not go to that level. I am not such a low, you know, low level. So, it, Bhagavad Gita is all about the greatest text of motivation also. Because it clarifies thoughts. It gives a different perspective to life, which is all we are all missing today. So, whichever way you see, Bhagavad Gita is a, a great text. Adi Shankara's uh, commentary on Bhagavad Gita is fantastic. His, his opening introduction itself is so beautiful. He says, Pravriti and Nivriti. He says, Abhu Yudhaya and Nishraya. Some beautiful concepts he brings before he introduces the central concepts in Bhagavad Gita. Those are very relevant for us. We don't seem to be even bothered about many of those by and large. So that is what it is about. Now, what are the specific takeaways in Bhagavad Gita? If you ask, uh, what are you talking about, sir? Can you get into a little more uh, specificity and so on? Right? Now, at least these are all my personal feeling. These are all my personal, you know, uh, uh, own feeling because for last 10, 12 years, I am very seriously reading Bhagavad Gita for my own sake. Right? Now, it appears to me that the greatest contribution of Bhagavad Gita is it helps individuals to build their inner strength and character. I think that's all we need in life. Nothing else we need in life. Is there a way we can develop inner strength and character? If you ask me, sir, can you tell me what is this inner strength and character business all about? Now my students keep asking me also when I say all these. Right? There are few things. Strength and gentleness must coexist. Can you develop a character in which you have strength and gentleness? Today, you know, all that I am telling are on, on two sides of personality today. If somebody has gentleness, people think this fellow is weak. This is uh, prototyping today, stereotyping today. Whereas, if you really develop character, strength and gentleness will coexist. You will have phenomenal strength, but you will have, you'll be very gentle also. Which means, you know, the way you deal with people is uh, of a very different plane. You will experience it. The more and more you read Gita, small, small ways you will start experiencing this feeling. Great broad-mindedness must develop along with intensity of faith and conviction. Faith and conviction today means narrow-mindedness. This is today's stereotyping. I am telling you, I have greatest faith in God. I have broad-mindedness. I mean, I should not be saying, and I am just saying that I, I endeavor to be broad-minded also. Being, uh, you know, otherwise I cannot survive in IAM, let me tell you. You know, it's a place where all kinds of people come and you can't be very narrow-minded there. You will be bundled out and you will be good for nothing. If you truly understand ancient Indian wisdom, you will develop faith and conviction that doesn't mean that you become narrow-minded, you will become broad-minded. Oh, you know, my students sometimes challenge me, sir, what is this faith that you are talking about? I said, I will tell you examples from my own life because that is better. Because the last 10 years, the kind of trauma I have gone through, God has been kind to me, I am able to take. My sister's son was my, I am the guardian, I was guardian for him. He studied in Arvi College of Engineering. Final year, two more months or three more months, very bright chap, very intelligent. He CET rank of some 72 or something, some very bright fellow. He played tennis, there is one uh, sports academy near the Bangalore University on the Mysore Road. He played tennis, evening he is going back, that time they were laying that, making the four road. So sometimes they leave the traffic here, something. So suddenly that day morning they have changed the traffic here, I think. So there is a slow lorry going, being youngsters in a bike, so they wanted to, just in front of the college, 100 meters he is inside the college. His fellow crosses the lorry, at full speed a KSRTC bus comes. There is a concrete uh, median on this side, lorry on this side. So obviously there is very little choice. This fellow uh, head on, he is banged and then he was thrown out. And we don't know, in 20 minutes this fellow was conscious. He told uh, somebody to bring an ambulance and he said, take me to Malaya hospital. Then they called me. I was to come in a 7.30 flight, I come in a 5.30 flight, I don't know why. For some reason I change the flight and then from Madras I come in a 5.30 flight. So I end and uh, land here and come home and I receive this call and then I go to Malaya. Next day morning 5 o'clock, the duty doctor calls and tells me, who are you? I said, I am his uncle. He said, this fellow will die in about 15 minutes or half an hour or so. Fat embolism, this is quite complicated. His brain and lungs and kidney is full of fat. He will not survive. So I, I ask my students, you use your rational mind or use faith now? At morning 5 o'clock, if I use my rational mind, I would have collapsed. I would have been next to him in the ICU. Never try to use rational mind. Rational mind is very limited, ladies and gentlemen. I am telling, I am telling out of experience. 
Rationality can go only up to a point. That's why Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, Ahankara Vimudatma Karte Miti Ahamanye. If you use too much of rationality, you think I am doing. I am telling you, in life you do nothing. If you think you are doing something, you will understand one day. At morning 5.30, I had absolutely no rational mind. I had only faith. And not, I didn't have faith that he will survive. My faith was not that. My faith was that something will happen. And I had a faith that the entire family will have the courage to take what comes. This fellow is now, you know, going strong, he went to Himalayas and all that happened later. But I am telling, faith is very, very important in life. Please don't underestimate. Today in this modern education, they are told faith, faith is narrow-minded. Faith is your strength. Draupati Vastra Aparana should not be understood rationally. Please don't read that story with a rational mind, which is what they are taught in schools and all places. Because if you use a rational mind, the question you will ask is, how many kilometers of cloth came? Who rolled the cloth? Who unrolled the cloth? How was it possible that you can roll a cloth? You can ask any number of questions. Rational mind is very, very low. It's very, very nasty, I am telling you. You should use rationality only up to your point. Draupati's story is, when she took both her hands off, the, the whole thing came, I mean, you, should, you should understand it differently. You should not, if you read rationally, it is nonsense. That's why most ancient Indian wisdom is nonsense. Because we are reading with the Western mind. Indian mind is intuitive. The strength of Indian mind is reflective and intuitive, not necessarily rational. Today we are converting our mind into purely rational. 99.9% .9 rationality and 0.1% intuitive mind. We were never like that. So every story must be understood at a subtle meaning. There is a sukshma tattva. Today we are all bothered with Stula Tattva. On the surface we read and understand. Faith is very important that if you develop, you will actually become more broad-minded. You will take life much better. So that's what I mean to uh, say that. Intense fearlessness and intense competition, uh, uh, compassion. Today again, compassion means weak. People think if somebody is compassionate, you are a useless fellow here. You should, you know, fight your way. These are not we are all told. Whereas in in, in Brigadaranya Upanishad, Yajnavalkya says, Abhayam vai prapto si janakaha. Now you are fearless. Oh janaka, you are now fearless because you understood the ultimate truth. That's what in, in Brigadaranya Upanishad, Yajnavalkya says. It's a beautiful Upanishad. The conversation between Yajnavalkya and Janaka is masterpiece. The kind of issues that are being discussed between Maitreyi and Yajnavalkya. It's a great Upanishad. In fact, all the ten Upanishads are great. Great ideas. So he says, Abhayam vai prapto si janakaha. Now you are fearless. You don't only have compassion, you have, you have become fearless. In chapter 12 of Bhagavad Gita, very, in Bhakti Yoga, very clearly Krishna says, Yasmatna adyujeta lokaha. On seeing whom people are not afraid. Right? Lokatna adyujeta sahaya. I am also not afraid of others. Others are also not afraid of me. That's a very different kind of a frame mind. I saw that in, in Dr. Venkata Swami. Because I asked one lower level worker, what do you tell about Dr. Venkata Swami, who is your founder of this Aravind Ayya Hospital? And she said, she didn't use this shloka, but she said exactly this. He said, sir, we are not afraid of him. We have such a, uh, you know, this person is full of compassion. Yet, there is something which uh, we have our own limits and we know how to. And she very strangely, that nurse put a statement. I was reminded of Bhakti Yoga of Bhagavad Gita when, when she said that. You have to develop that character. That's, a, that's a, you know, nice thing about developing a character. So Bhagavad Gita gives all these kinds of uh, different ideas which you don't uh, understand if you look at it more carefully. One more thing about Bhagavad Gita before taking a few couple of examples. It's not only, it's my, again my personal experience, it is not only about Bhagavad Gita, it is about Bhagavatam, it is about Ramayana, it's about Mahabharata, if you read uh, you know, Puranas or Dashopanishad or Brahma Sutra, anything you read. Ancient Indian wisdom has three dimensions and they are not compartmentalized. There are three dimensions in anything that you read in ancient Indian wisdom. The three dimensions are spiritual dimension, religious dimension and secular dimension. What I mean secular dimension is useful for day to day materialistic life. And they are not in compartments. You know what is the biggest misconception today in India in Indian society? Ancient Indian wisdom is all useless for day to day thing. You want, you know, morning one hour you tell some puja, ija, something, use Vishnu Sahasrama and all that. One of my friend who is a big management consultant in Madras, he uses Vishnu Sahasrama and then talks management theory there. He takes one nama and spends one hour. He is able to draw that much out of that. I will take two, three examples to just talk about it. There is one shoka in chapter 2. Vasamsi jirnani yata vihaya navani grinati naroparani tata jirnani vihaya sharirani anyani 
samyati navani dehi. There's a nice sloka, 30 second sloka in chapter 2. What it says is, just as if the shirt is torn, if, if the shirt is torn, you don't sit down in a corner and cry. You just throw it. You say, over. Life is over. Right? So much so in school, they ask the children to write the essays. Write the essay of a cotton which has now been thrown. You know, the journey of its cotton from, you know, all these are written in our own school days. If the child, jirnani vastrani yata vihaya, you just throw it. In the same way, Krishna says, the soul thinks this physical body is of no use anymore. Throw it. That's all. The, the example I give is, both of us are traveling in a train to Bombay. Let's say Udyan Express, both of us are going. Now, you know, we don't know each other, but generally we know, we keep talking, we share our food and then all, all politics, this and all that, you, we talk. You get down at Pune. If you get down at Pune, I don't sit down and cry. There we have the wisdom. We understand that part of it very well. Just because you get down in uh, Pune, I don't sit in a corner and cry. I know that's the fact of life. But we are not able to do it when somebody in our family passes, passes away. It's no different. It is only the resolution is different. The concept is same. The phenomenon is same. The resolution is instead of 1x, you have 1000x now. Or 100x. It's as simple as that. That's what Krishna says. Now this is a spiritual idea. If you wish. You may say this is a spiritual idea. Now I use this sloka to teach innovation. Joseph Schumpeter in 1950 wrote a paper called Creative Destruction. Innovation through Creative Destruction. To me that's what this sloka is saying. If you don't throw your old ideas, where is the new idea in an organization? If you want new ideas, this is a crux of innovation theory. So here it is that not only spiritual idea, there is a materialistic idea. The innovation theory is contained in it. New ideas, if it has to come, we have to throw old. That's why we, you know, in consulting we say mindset inertia. The biggest challenge in organization is they have mindset, they don't change. So unless they change, they cannot go into new things. That's what the shloka is saying. So this is an innovation theory to me. That's the meaning of the shloka in addition to a spiritual meaning. He talks about life, birth and death, all those are there. But it also has lot of value for some of the things that we do in the name of materialistic world also. This talks about innovation theory. One more shloka, which every one of you know, there is a title song of Mahabharata. Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyuttanama dharmasya tadatmanam srijamyaham paritranaya sadhuna. This is the seventh shloka in chapter 4 of Bhagavad Gita. Interestingly, in the first three chapters of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna never reveals himself as God. He talks to Arjuna as a cousin. Suddenly in chapter 4, you should read the first five shlokas. You'll, your head will spin. Because his first shloka, you know what he says? He says, you know, when Vivaswan was born, I taught him this yoga. And you know, then in the fourth shloka, Katam etat vijaniyam bhavan adav proktavan iti. Arjuna says, what are you talking? How do I know you told to Vivaswan? Vivaswan is millions of years ago. So he changes his mind from, he says, don't look at me anymore like a cousin, I am going to tell you very important things. So I have now raised myself to a higher platform, otherwise you are not going to listen. So avatara tattva, it is a religion. Here Krishna is God. Yeda yeda hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata is a avatara purusha mahima tattva. This is about incarnation principle. Here it is actually a religious idea. Right? Now, the same idea is what one over scientist called Stafford Beer. He is a Canadian. He wrote a paper in 1984 in a journal called Interfaces, which is a good over journal. The title of the paper was called Loka Samastha Tsukina Bhavantu. That's the title of the paper. In which he quoted this, he said this is a very important principle in cybernetics. What is he talking about? It is, and in economics, we, I use this. You know what is contained in this? It says when system goes out of equilibrium, price... All economic principles can be explained with Yeda Yeda Yi Dharmasya Glanir Bhavati. Dharmasya Glanir Bhavati means price goes to crude, price, price of crude goes to 200 dollars. So somebody, somebody must come and set it back. So it's an equilibrium principle which is written here. Many of the economic principles are contained in this shloka. If only we know how to look at it that way also. That is missing. So what I am trying to say, I think, but I have such interpretation for Gita and many of the Puranas and Upanishads. What I am trying to say is our inability to understand this has led to a situation we have stereotyped this as useless material and thrown it into the drain. Every shloka can be understood from different dimensions because that is what is the greatness of these scriptures. Third aspect about greatness of Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita has thoughts 
which are very relevant for today. For example, in chapter 3 of Bhagavad Gita, 37th sloka, Arjuna says, Atakena praito yam papam charati purusha anichanapi vashreya baladivan yojita. Beautiful sloka. He says, Anichanapi, I am not interested, I didn't want to do. Icha was not there. Anichanapi vashreya, oh, uh, vashreya is the adjective for Krishna. Baladivan yojita. Somebody is pushing me. How many times we have said I have become a victim of situation? Atakena praito, who is, who is making me to do all this? That's the question Arjuna asked. Atakena Priyuktaha Papam Charati Purusha Priyuktaha Papam Charati Purusha Why did we commit? You know, we sometimes shout at our daughter or son because we have some problem somewhere. He came and shouted at the children. Then we sit back and say, why did I do it? Unfortunately, this poor girl or poor boy I slapped or I shouted at. Right? Very similar. Such questions are there in Bhagavad Gita. Very relevant thoughts which every one of us have been thinking for which answers are also there. Next six slogans are beautiful. There is a nice description in Kata Upanishad, Buddhim tu Saratim Vidhi. There is a statement. Understand, there is a charioteer, there is a horse, there is this rain, there is the Adhikari who is sitting, the Ajamana who is sitting in the chariot. It is exactly mapped to senses, mind, buddhi and ahankara. All those are there in the next six slokas. It tries to explain why do we make such blunders in life. The practical answers for practical questions. In chapter 6, in Dhyana Yoga, there is a nice couple of slokas. He says, Chanchalam hi mano buddhi hi Pramati balavadridam Tasyaham Balavariva dushkaram Chanchalam tasyaham nigraham manye Vayavariva sudushkaram Arjuna says all these are fine All that you are saying Very interesting Krishna But I tell you Catching the mind is like catching the air Which is very practical You know they don't talk um, Ivory tower issues at all in any of these texts he says, Chanchalam hi Mano Krishna, Pramati Balavadram. It's so powerful. That's why while I'm talking, I can go to San Francisco. I can go from there to, you know, uh, Opera House in uh, Sydney and then come to Rome and then come back to Bandaragata Road also. Mind is so powerful. It, chanchalam. Right? Tasyaham Nigraham Manye. I think controlling it, you keep talking about controlling the mind. Tasyaham Nigraham Manye. Vayari Vasudushka. It's like catching air. How can you catch air here? And Krishna replies, Asamshayam Mahabaho. Mano Dish Nigraham Chalam Abhyase Nutukaunteya Vairagena Grihyate So, questions are very relevant and there are detailed answers for it, right? But in the same chapter, chapter 6, there is a beautiful sloka Uddharet Atmana Atmanam Na Atmanam Avasadayet Atmaiva Banduhu Atmanam Atmaiva Ripuratmana This Atmaiva Banduhu Atmanam Atmaiva Ripuratmana If you have understood, it says your mind is your foe or your friend, it is in your hands if you know how to train your mind, you will be successful because it becomes your friend. Atmaiva Banduhu Atmanam. Atmaiva Ripuhu. The choice is yours. So therefore, success in life and building character is about mind. Life is a mind game at the end of the day. Then these texts, ancient Indian wisdom, not only Bhagavad Gita, is a masterpiece on mind game. What is this mind game all about? How do we actually address these kinds of issues? I think they are very interesting ideas. How can you, you know, discard all of them as uninteresting and useless? We might have done it because we don't know what is in that. The entire ancient Indian wisdom is like this. Okay, I will quickly get into two, three specific kind of aspects and then leave it at that. <clears throat> the first thing that I talked about is developing inner character. Because this is a major issue of concern for me, even in management, when I teach, I see managers, I find today, you know, what is the situation, both at school, home, offices, everywhere, somehow, I don't know from where we got it, maybe from the western world, because there is no other way we can uh, get this idea, we are all told that only good things can happen to us, only good things can happen to us, bad things cannot happen to us, who said bad things can happen? Which means this year performance, next year 10% more or 20% more. Even I ask some of my software friends because they say by quarter by quarter we are going 40%, 60% growth year on year. This year my turnover is 1000 crores, next year 1600 crores. So I ask some of my MBA students, can you tell me one creature man nature has created, one species that nature has created which can grow 100% year on year for so many years. So they were all thinking, one fellow put his hand, he said, yes sir, I know. 
So I was a little bit jittery because I thought I am going to get uh, defeated by this. Yes sir, it is possible, it is called cancerous growth. <laughs> he gave me an answer. If somebody grows 100% year on year, that means he is not growing, he is dying. He or she is dying. But modern management thinking in schools, people are told, no, you have to go there, you know, performance more, 90%, 92%. I have told my daughter, she is in second PU. I used to tell her six years back. I used to tell her at this rate, when you finish your PU, right, for 500 marks, you have to get some 655 or something, because already 500, 499 has come. So state first is 497 or something. This was five years back. So I used to jokingly tell my daughter, 500, you have to get 650. If you get 500, if you get 600, you will be in state some 1000 rank or 20,000. We are pushing the whole society there. We are told, every one of us are told, only good things can happen. You should aim for only good things. You should aim for, aim for only big things and so on. Whereas, you know what is the greatest contribution of Bhagavad Gita and ancient Indian wisdom? The capacity to withstand nonsense in life is very, very important in character building. We should develop capacity to withstand nonsense in life. Life is a roller coaster. Who said life has only this way? If you go, you know, the gravity builds so much. One day when you fall, you are nowhere. It's not going to happen. So in chapter 2, Bhagavad Gita, in 30 places, Krishna talked about this. This is to me the number one message in Bhagavad Gita. In chapter 2, up to the 11th shloka, it's all Arjuna pouring, leave me alone, I want to run away, I don't want to fight this war, right? Shadi maam prapannam, that's what he says. Leave me alone, I don't want to fight. Why should I fight? I can't kill my, you know, puja ho arisudhana. He says, they are all worthy of worship, you are asking me to kill them? Leave me alone. In the 11th sloka, in chapter 2, the actual, you know, advice starts. The real Gita Upadesha starts from the 11th sloka of chapter 2. 14th sloka, 3rd sloka from there. That's a beautiful sloka. It says, Matras Parsast Kauteya, Sitoshna Sukha Dukkataha, Agamapayinam Anityaha Tam Titiksha Sobharata. Beautiful sloka. Titiksha. If our students, if our people, youngsters understand the meaning of Titiksha, I think we should take a dictionary, take some ancient Indian wisdom, look at all references for Titiksha, we will become great individuals. Krishna says, Matras Parsast Kauteya. You have Pancha Tanmatras. And the Pancha Tanmatras become Pancha Indriyas. The subtle element, you know, touch, feel, hear and so He says, as long as these Pancha Tanmatras are in touch, Sparsa, Matras, Sparsa, Kaunteya, as long as these Tanmatras are in touch with the outside world, it will blow hot and cold. Sita, Ushna, Sukha, Dukkha, Sita, Ushna, Sukha, Dukkha, Taha. So when will it not happen? Only under two conditions. Either you should be dead or you should be brain dead. If you are in coma, nothing will happen. Or you should be dead. Then matras parsa na bhavati. As long as you are living, the matras will be in touch. So Arjuna, he says, hey Arjuna, as long as this world and you are living, you, it will blow hot and cold. Sometimes it will be good, sometimes it will be bad. Right? Adama Paino, they please understand they have a habit of coming and going. You have developed that faith in life. Good things will also come and go. Bad things also will come and go. Agama Paino Anitya. They are not Nitya. They are Anityaha. Tam Titikshisa. Titiksha. If you develop the sense of... So what is the important lesson in life? Important lesson in life is there will be a world of duality of plus and minus. Right? Good, bad. Everything will be there in life. Can you go beyond the world of dualities? If you live in the world of dualities, one day you will party, other day you will go for psychological counseling. One day you will be on cloud nine, one day you will be in Patala. So Krishna says that you have to really transcend. If you are developing that frame of mind, understand this principle, you will become a great leader. You will become a great person in life if you develop a sense of equanimity. There are several places this equanimity has been. So I want to quote some of them because it is very, very important. I want to quote the 38 places Krishna has actually quoted this notion of equanimity. Some of them I want to you know, quickly go over. You know, there is a nice sloka. Sukha dukke same kritva labha labha jaya jayo tato yuddha yujyasya naivam papam avapsesi He is saying go and fight. Arjuna why are you hiding behind? Go and fight. And he says when you fight he talks about three types of dualities and in every one of our life these three types of dualities that's why I picked up this shloka. It says sukha dukke same kritva sukha and dukkha take it equal. Try to develop a mind in which sukha also comes okay 
Dukkha also comes, okay. There is some 70th sloka in chapter 2. He says, Apuryamanam achala pratishtam samudram yava pravishanti yatvat. He says, just like the greatest of the river Brahmaputra and Ganges will empty their water into Bay of Bengal, Bay of Bengal will not even shake. Apuryamanam, it is full. Achala pravishtam, it doesn't shake. Apuryamanam achala pravishtam samudram yat pravishanti apaha yatvat. If you develop that state of mind, nobody can do anything for you in life. That's what he says. He uses that in the Savatiya Sloka. Apuryamanam achala pratishtam. Just like this, uh, ocean is unshaken by the, you know, millions of millions of liters of water which are being, you know, pumped into it. Can you be like that? I mean, that's the benchmark that Krishna has given for this equanimity. But here he says, Sukadukhe samaya kritva, labha labha jaya jaya. There are three, look at here, there are three dualities. Sukha dukha. Jaya Ajaya, Laba Alaba. There are three things he is saying. In every one of our activity, we have all the three. Right? And he says, Tato Yuddhaya. So, there is an activity. Let us start from there. We do an activity. Here it is a what? Yuddha. Tato Yuddhaya is what he says. So, in all of us, we have an activity. Now, in an activity, what will happen? You will get Jaya or Ajaya. You may succeed sometimes. You may not succeed. That is the world of duality there. And, moment, how do you know it is success or non-success? You use your brain and then analyze it. That's why laba alaba. When an outcome comes, so an activity gives an outcome. That outcome is analyzed by the brain. Then you get laba and alaba. You think this is gainful, this is not gainful. Because of that you get sukha, the mind starts working. Sukha and dukkha. So Krishna says that there are three levels of duality in anything you do. There is a duality of outcome, there is a duality of uh, assessment and there is a duality of feelings. If you are able to work on these planes of duality, papam na avap sesi, you are fighting a war will do nothing for you. In other words, every day we are fighting a war. You can take whatever war is there in Bhagavad Gita, replace it with your day-to-day -day work. We are all doing war only. We are, that's how we have to understand Bhagavad Gita. So we have to engage in our activities in that particular fashion. That's what he says, samatvam yoga uchyate. Some Amrutatvaya Kalpate. Somebody says he will reach. Krishna has given all possible adjectives to Samatva. He says, can you develop that? In chapter 5 he says, Vidya Vinaya Sampanne Brahmane Gavihastini Swanisascha Sopakascha Pandita Samadarshina. He says, who is learned? Today learned people are very class conscious because our education is Avidya. Our education, Vidya Dadati Vinayam, you have to delete that sentence. Vidya does not give Vinayam today. The problem is with the Vidya, what we are learning today is Avidya. The educated people are very class conscious. If you are very class conscious, you can never spiritually grow. Impossible, I will take a challenge on it. If you are very class conscious, you will never spiritually grow. And if you don't spiritually grow, you don't get fulfillment. Fulfillment is not in the brain, it is in the heart. There are two positions in our body. One is brain, another is heart. Anything that you get in brain is out of ahankar. Anything you get out of heart is permanent. That's why people don't say, I have a heady meal. They say, we have a hearty meal. I had a heart to heart talk. Nobody says, I had a head to head talk. These words are used in common parlance without understanding. Heart has a different meaning. If your heart fills, it fills permanently. If your head fills, your ahankara goes for several fold. So we have to work for the heart, not for the brain. Brain used to be used only to fill the heart. So that is what Krishna actually says. So Vidya... Pandita Samadarshina means the heart is filling, not the brain is filling. Today's Panditas are filling the brain a lot, including me perhaps, all of us. Because that is the nature in which the Vidya is being propagated. It's called Avidya actually. Right? That's what he says. Jitatmana Prashantasya Paramatma Samahita Sitosha Sukadukkeshu Tata Mana Apamaneo. There is one in chapter 14. That means very good. I will actually talk about it. It's a very nice two sloka. I use it for leadership. I say, what is really leadership? Krishna beautifully has put in two slokas. I experience all of them in my professional life. It says, Sama Dukkha Sukha Swastha hai, Sama Loshtashma Kanchana hai, Tulya Priya Priyo Dira hai, Tulya Nindatma Samstuti hai, Mana Pa Manayos Tulya hai, Tulya Mitra Ripakshayo ho, Sarvaramba Parityagi Gunati ta hai saucchete. Let me explain this, it's so beautiful. Look at here. Sama Dukkha Sukha hai. A leader is one who will take both, okay. Good performance, fine. Bad performance, okay. So, that's Samatva, which I was talking about. That's the first thing he says. 
somehow lostashma kanchana losta you know stone and kanchana you give me a, a stone and a kanchana i should not even blink my eye there are the biggest bane of a leadership and politician today is for them it is uh, very different things we are ruining the society because we have lost this samatva lostashma the the, the, the the princely kings of the astral india were not like this lostashma kanchana kanchana and lostha should look very similar to you you should not get carried away by it. i mean they are similar in terms of value and worth don't think like that what i mean is your mental response to it this is second thing then he says tulya priya priyo dhira hai priya hai apriya hai i like him i don't like him you know how leadership gets spoiled by these kind of things i like this person i don't like this person he says don't do it he is a dhira dhira is not a you know, dhira is not one who is very valuable and courageous dhira is one who uses his buddhi d means buddhi dhira has one uses his brain correctly that's the meaning of dhira so he says tulya priya apriyo dhira then he says tulya ninda atma samstuti only great leaders possess this quality ninda and atma samstuti if somebody tells bad if the greatest leader or manager is one who encourages somebody to adversely comment i very rarely i see people allow that if you are able to get people criticize you that's a free consulting for you otherwise people are digging your grave at your back that's what most managers do they don't like they don't tolerate you should be able to allow it with a controlled way you should be able to do it so atma stuti you are indra and chandra they give him promotion they get him to the next position this is rampant in corporate as krishna says you never become a great leader unless you develop tulya ninda atma samstuti ninda and atma samstuti you should be able to take it equally man apamane astulya sometimes you your performance succeeds you you get <coughs> mana sometimes you get apamana man apamane astulya you should be able to maintain your balance when good things when you, you know what you have done is a failure you tr- you try but things fail people lose their cool in the in the process they lose some good relationship they lose even their credibility at times i have seen this in corporate world then he say this is very interesting he says tulya mitra ari pakshayo in every conference room meeting moment somebody makes a statement this man first finds out which camp he belongs to then only understands it mitra paksha or ari paksha mitra paksha is he belongs to me ari paksha is belongs to the opposite camp so the meaning is interpreted only after you place this person tag in first krishna says don't do it you will be never a great leader if you do that he says tulya mitra ari pakshayo so every year if you show that balance sarvaramba parityagi gunatita has uchite you have developed the character which is ultimate what more leadership lesson you can ask for in very practical terms there is an example there are many of them you we put all of them together you get a solid idea of leadership which you will actually find so essentially people developing character in the strength is all about being little bit spiritual spirituality is not something which is given at the age of 70 if you develop spirituality at the age of 20 you are blessed if you develop if you are born spiritual you are even more blessed spirituality does not mean that you give up everything and then sit in one middle of if the entire bhagavad gita is all about thick activity if i this was a misconception it started bhagavad gita 15 years back i thought oh bhagavad gita means uh, oh it's a spiritual text that means give up job no at every turn of the moment krishna says be in the, emotionally you know uh, disengage physically engage that's the message in bhagavad gita physically engage in the world emotionally disengage you will find a very different world for yourselves so spirituality does not mean running away sitting in the forest or you know not eating and all that in chapter c he says don't starve yeah he says don't starve don't eat too much but don't starve very nice ideas he has given he says don't uh, you know disturb your body too much but don't over eat and become tamasic every idea is there so spirituality is not about running away or then losing interest in the world it is actually getting more interest in the world you go and see dr venkata swami his interest on the world was thousand times my interest on the world he was truly spiritual and that you will get only when you become spiritual if you don't become spiritual you will say what is in it for me and then pressure will come you will get stress and then you work will all that will happen anyway so much with respect to this the second idea is this this abusing nature in fact i am tired of people saying let us protect nature let me tell you you cannot protect nature you possible protect yourself i am seriously saying this you cannot protect nature if possible you protect yourself you don't know how natural systems work please need large systems theory i have read a lot of large systems theory nature are large systems 
There are a lot of interesting work happening, research happening, God hypothesis and so on. It says you better protect yourself and honor nature. I mean, the Westerners are so much fed up, you know, preoccupied with protecting nature and tweaking it. I was in New Hampshire for one year. And do you know what that government, state of New Hampshire does? In the month of September, they issue licenses for hunting. Because they have done back of the envelope calculation to find out how many animals of this category must be there. How many animals of this, this is too much of fixing nature. Western mind is like that. So once there was a particular deer, they said so much deer licenses they issued. Elder brother went, elder brother or younger brother also went. The younger brother instead of shooting the deer, he shot his dear brother. He died. So this is the fixation of nature. Whereas you know what Krishna has said in Bhagavad Gita are many, but I want to talk only one shloka. In chapter 3, chapter 3 there is this yajna principle which is a masterpiece. If you don't do yajna, you have no business to sustain in this world. If you means your future generation. This is a beautiful principle, cardinal principle of yajna. Chapter 3 and chapter 4, beautifully it is there, but I pick up one shloka. He says, Devan Bhavayata Anena, Te Deva Bhavayanta Vayam, Parasparam Bhavayanta Shreya Param Avapsyata. The culmination of this argument is one shloka, this shloka. He says, Devan Bhavayanta Vayam, you be, you know, uh, uh, very responsible to the Deva. Deva, don't think immediately, don't look at the CV, TV serial clouds in which people are floating. It is not that. Deva means somebody superior to you. It may be your boss in your organization, it may be your father, it may be your grandfather, it may be a local influential person with whom you are to live. World is a world of interdependence. Nobody lives in vacuum. We all live in a world of interdependence. So Deva and Bhava I am. If you protect Devas, protect means, you know, be in harmony. Te Deva Bhava I am. In turn they will. Then the second sentence is beautiful. He says, Parasparam Bhava Shreya hai parama is a cardinal principle of Shreyas. He says you will succeed in life, Arjuna, whatever you do, if you honor the principle of mutual dependence. Parasparam bhavayanta. I have read particle physicists books on mutual dependence. Fridge of Capra has written about half a dozen books. Web of Life, Interconnectedness, Tower of Physics, Turning Point. You read all these books, you find there is only one issue. If you don't know how to respect mutual dependence, finished. That's what we are doing in the name of uh, exploiting nature. We think nature is something which is out to be exploited. We are not understood that we have to live in, in harmony. That's why don't protect by putting some trees. You can never protect. Protect, you know, you protect yourself by not cutting trees or you know, doing something else which does not uh, antagonize. Natural systems have their own self-correction. Nobody on earth can do anything about it. There are very rich theories on it in modern science. Natural systems decide to correct themselves. That's called pralaya in Bhagavatam. So we also conceptualize that idea. Pralaya is nothing but Eda Eda Hi Dharmasi of a higher order. Equilibrium principle, <coughs> which is actually coming here. My daughter every day tells me 2012 is the last. <laughs> you know, Pralaya, she is uh, you know, jokingly saying that. So, oh, this mutual dependence is very important. Son has a sense of mutual dependence with the father and the mother. The boss has a mutual dependence with the subordinate. I am telling you, the moment the boss thinks I can do any, everything myself, I am the one who is doing, you, he will face music, at the, he may be the CEO. People will just desert him. It is true. I think if you don't know how to honor mutual dependence, we will never make a life which is interesting. It is husband and wife is mutual dependent. Today everything is contracted. All marriages are contracted because there is no mutual dependence. It is all on piece of paper. So you can tear the contract and then do something else later. Whereas we never believed in We believe the world is a world of mutual dependence. In everything that we do. There are many shlokas, but this is what it is. This is a cardinal principle of sustainability. Which Krishna, there are many shlokas here and there which he talks about and so on. The third thing, a little bit of time I will spend, which is uh, work as drudgery. Because this is very, very real. Today everybody thinks, oh, work is drudgery, therefore I need a break. Right? I need a weekend getaway. I am fed up with this word getaway. The only problem I see is Saturdays I have stopped going out because the traffic jam is some five times. Then the usual thing in Bangalore. This is the only price of weekend getaway I find for others. I don't do any getaways. To be 24 by 7 is getaway. And 24 by 7 is work. I truly mean it. I never get tired. And my wife is asking, why are you not getting tired? I said, I don't get tired. Simple. I sleep 6 hours. 11 o'clock I sleep and 4.30 I get up. That's all my sleep is. The start time I find something to do. So, work is drudgery today. And uh, it is antithesis to Bhagavad Gita. Why? Because I will tell you one beautiful sloka. In chapter 4, there are a lot, lot of ideas about work. So, karma yoga, karma sannyasa, karma jnana, jnana karma sannyasa yoga, therefore. So, there is a nice sloka. 
कर्मणि अकर्म है या पश्चेत अकर्मणि च कर्म यह है सब बुद्धिमान मनुष्य ऐसो कृष्ण कर्म कृत इसे ये मिलता है पैराडॉक्सिकल स्लोगा कृष्ण आसे इस कर्मणि अकर्म है यह है पश्चेत व्हेन यू आर डूइंग वर्क यू शुड नॉट बी यू शुड डू नो वर्क देर यू शुड फील आज देर यू डू नो वर्क देर कर्मणि अकर्म है यह पश्चेत वन हु इज एबल टू सी नो वर्क व्हेन डूइंग वर्क अकर्मणि कर्म यह है व्हेन यू आर नॉट डूइंग एनीथिंग यू यू आर सीइंग वर्क आई मीन इट लुक्स वेरी कॉम्प्लिकेटेड टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस देयर इज अ डीप मीनिंग टू इट आई विल टेक अ फ्यू एग्जांपल्स यू कैन गो एंड आस्क एनी नोबल लॉरियट वंस दे गेट द नोबल लॉरियट देन ऑल दीस पेपर्स एंड पुट फोटोज इंटरव्यूज एंड सो ऑन यू हॉनेस्टली गो एंड आस्क नॉट नोबल लॉरियट्स गो एंड आस्क पीपल हु हैव ट्रूली मेड अ डिफरेंस टू लाइफ नॉट टू नॉट टू देम but to a larger so go and ask narayana murthy or sudha murthy go and ask this is what they they will articulate they will exactly say this they say we don't feel tired where is where is tiredness we don't feel tired there is nothing like uh, you know uh, the tiredness comes when you do a work with what is in it for me moment you take the what is in it for me you may be doing but if you take the what is in it for me from that you will actually pour energy like anything and you will be very relaxed in fact in ninth shloka in chapter 3 He puts a axiom of work. He says, "Yagnyatam karma, anyatra sarvam karma bandhanam." He says, "A and A prime." You know, this is what is called work. Anyatra sarvam, all others which is do- not done with the spirit of yagnya, or all not, they will, they will actually bind you. They will make you tired. They will stress you. They will create tension in you, and so on. So the day you understand the joy of working, you work for the sake of working. you are looking for results but then if you work for the sake of working you will find that work never tires the greatest achievers have always said that it's a passion for them today youngsters are missing passion youngsters are missing three things i am very bothered youngsters don't have passion some of them but there are good number of them don't because they are not told youngsters don't have attitude maybe they develop after some over some time youngsters more importantly don't have empathy never have sympathy sympathy is ahankar have empathy we are swami vivekananda says kneel down and say this beggar is a daridra narayana you are given me an opportunity to help a person you, you should not say i will help you i have money so i will throw some money that is sympathy sympathy is looking down on somebody please don't do that every soul is divine for some strange situation somebody has become beggar somebody has become less privileged somebody has become more privileged our culture is don't look anybody pandita samadarshina right so never you bring sympathy into life this is my humble request to you never bring sympathy into life please bring empathy into life which means you step in you say for one stroke of imagination god has been kind to me if i had become as proper as he is your thought process will change your brain will stop working and your heart will start working please kick off your heart also once in a while you are using brain too much particularly with this uh, new western influence our preoccupation with the brain is too much i think we should also invoke our heart a little bit which is what uh, you know all these are important so he says akarmani karma hai ha pase so you should be able to work in such a way thomas alva edison had 200 failures he never went to utility building and jumped from there because it was pleasure for him he was just going through this process <coughs> he was not looking at what was happening and so on but i have several examples for this right work done with a deep sense of devotion you have the every one of us have deep sense of devotion to somebody who made a difference to my life with them you don't see what is in it for me you don't evaluate results so we not that we don't know all these we use it very selectively these texts say that if you enlarge it more and more you enlarge it you become very you know great you become very so that's what it says second example work done with selfless love a mother attending to a child will never do it with what is in it for me the day if that happens the society will be closed switched off period the selfless love work of a mother is the greatest living example of karmani akarma hai yah pashit why do i when my daughter is how one year old single daughter one year old why is a professor of iim bangalore plays with the daughter as a one year old child and then spend one hour with the toy because that is you your last your identity you lost your identity and you are, you are enjoying the process of doing it otherwise if you rationally analyze it you will laugh at everything you will go to nimans and get admitted and do some treatment also so never use rationality there you understand the larger principle there selfless love is karmani akarma hai apashyat 
work done with enormous passion. Dr. Venkatasamy, I have, I have really not been able to sleep after I've seen what he has done. Man, it's uh, completely, you know, thought useless by the organization. In fact, last May I was in a place called, uh, you know, in, in Tamil Nadu, there is a Tirunal Valley district. In the South Tirunal Valley district, I went to a place called Amar Seva Sangam. Two days I couldn't sleep. I heard about it, so I went. This person was an electronics engineer. He came to Bangalore. He is of my age, but he eight, nine, something like that. He came to Bangalore. He attended the army interview that, uh, you know, in one of those exercises, he fell from some 25 feet and broke his back. He hails from the place where I was born. That's why another interest for me to go. In our village, I, I know what will happen. They will put this man, broke his back. What they will do, generally they put him at one corner, they will give him food. They will take a rum, he will die in about a year or two. That's all we can do and that's all in villages they will do. This man broke his back, right? And he comes back. In, this happened in you know 80 or 79, I don't remember, 82 or something. He goes back, he says, uh, this is not the end of life. And today, you know, he is very busy. I went, I it took uh, three hours for me to see him. So he runs one of the biggest NGO on, uh, you know, uh, uh, physically handicapped. The largest number of awards he has got. One room was full of awards. And he, 24 hours is not enough because there is so much work he is doing. He cannot expose himself to the, he cannot wear a shirt. It's completely damaged, I believe. He cannot expose himself to the sun. So evening, after 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock only, he will come to the ashram and then spend time. Daytime he sits in another place and then. I spent about two days there. I said, what is going on here? I mean, I am a useless character. This is a feeling I had for two days. So what I am saying is, passion if you get, karmani akarmaha eha paschet will have. Sir, buddhiman manushyeshu is what Krishna says. So the first element of removing drudgery is bring spirituality that comes through passion, that comes through uh, uh, you know uh, empathy, not sympathy. He never had sympathy. He is associated himself with a large number of uh, physically challenged people and doing things which are amazing. If you have time, go and see what he is doing. In Madurai, he met a CNN hero, top 10 hero, you know, Rajeshna, Narayan and Krishnan. I was stunned by what I saw. This fellow was, uh, you know, uh, was to join some five-star hotel somewhere in the, you know, Europe or somewhere. He came to Madurai, he happened to be a native of Madurai and then he went to the temple to do puja vija before going, he wanted to all that. On his way back he found a old man eating his own excreta because he had nothing else and that changed his life. This man through everything, he will go and shave, these are destitutes. I went and asked him, how do you identify destitutes? He said, come with me. I will show you how to identify destitutes. He says, destitutes are different from beggars. He says beggars will have mobile, destitutes will sit in a small circle in one corner, they will withdraw themselves. I went and saw several destitutes, today he is feeding. And he said, where is the money? I don't know sir. In fact, I have met many people who have done serious, doing serious social work, I ask them, where do you get money? Because I use my rational mind. They don't use their, if they ask where is the money, they will never do social service. They say, they, we are doing so, it will come. We can laugh at it, but then it's growing in great proportions. I went and saw that also. We need to develop that in life. We will, our degrees of freedom will become multiple fold. So that are some of the issues which we need to do. Work will never be drudgery. Today we are also, I used to wonder, Bharatanga Tilak was so active in politics. I question I ask is, how is he able to write a 4,000 page, 2,000 page commentary on Bhagavad Gita? So these people are actually 24 by 7 passionate about many things in life. They are great freedom fighters. They had a vibrant profession to do and they have time today we have time to go out of office come and see some cereal relax and sleep and we say we are doing too much work shame on us we are saying we are doing too much work we are shame on us I am telling you but you read Mahatma Gandhi's experiments in truth please read his complete work seven volumes are there I think it is shame on us they must have 40 hours a day perhaps and an energy which is some 5000 calories more than us it's not that it's that they are spiritual so the sum and substance of this whole story is if you don't develop spirituality, you will have spiritual emptiness. If you have spiritual emptiness, life is not interesting. It is stressful, it is boring, we need get away and this and that and so on and so forth. So ladies and gentlemen, I will stop here. I don't want to keep on going. I, think it's quite, I don't have watch, so people will pardon me for going a little longer because I am not able to time my watch now. You still have 10 minutes. You have 10 minutes, then a couple of other shlokas I will say and then leave it. So essentially the point I am trying to make is uh, 
I think uh, all these ancient Indian wisdom, if you see, there are very interesting uh, ideas on how to manage life. It's all life sciences. You know, I'm stunned by my daughter's uh, syllabus. It has every science other than life science. It has home science, computer science, this science, uh, you know, environmental science, environmental education, some moral science, immoral science, everything is there. Except life science. Today, if it is not being taught in school, I am already there. It is not being taught in homes. I was taught by my parents. I think every one of us have to teach life sciences to our children. Who is going to teach life sciences? Kids are, I am very pity, I am very pity, I have a lot of pity about youngsters because they have been left loose. Where we don't have time for serials and by the time we come home it is 9.30. Where we work for a multinational, so life is all about earning. Life is all about, uh, you know, uh, this thing. So that's why we are very preoccupied with that. Therefore, we don't know what to do with the children. We have, our paradigms have changed. Our paradigms of life has changed. Whereas if you look at these, it's all about life science. It's all about how do you manage life? How do you make a meaningful life? In fact, in, in chapter 2, Sita Prajna, there is a beautiful question which, in fact, let me tell you this also. There is this feeling that ancient Indian wisdom, ancestors, you know, in schools today particularly, it's a school, so I am keeping referring schools every now and then. In schools, it is a sin to ask question. If you ask questions, sometimes they put down. It's, it's uh, seen as a sense of disrespect and so on. Whereas if you look at, and I know all, there are few misconceptions about ancient, it's, it's not uh, correct to ask questions to elders. It's, uh, we don't work in groups. These, like this, there are some misconceptions. All of them are wrong. In Bhagavad Gita alone, you know what kind of questions Arjuna is asking? There are about 20, 25 questions. He's not lying, no. He's not just listening to Krishna. He stops every now and then and he asks question. And once he answers that question, he says, I don't agree. In fact, chapter 3 starts by saying, what Krishna, you are confusing me too much. Better be clear. You be clear. Arjuna says, Ekam Mada, Puram Nishche Ekam Mada. You are saying Sankhya and you are saying Karma, you better you make up your mind. So, he is not disrespectfully asked, it is asked in a very inquisitive way. That's why, you know, it says, Shraddhavan Lapate Jnana. Samshayatma Vinashyati. Krishna says, Samshayatma Vinashyati. I am seeing it day in and day out. A doubting mind will perish, is what Krishna says. And you doubt when your ankara is at your best. You say, I can do everything, I know everything, I am better than others, I know what to do, I know what to fix. If you, you revel in that, you will have more doubts about many things. Whereas you say, Tadviddi pranipate na pariprasne na sevaya upadekshanti te jnanam jnanina tattva darshina. That's what Krishna says. There are three conditions. He says, Tadviddi, please understand, O Arjun, what? Pranipate na. Fall at the feet. You know, if you go to Sabarmati Ashram, these great people, even Vardha Ashram today, you go, you have to clean the toilet. You know why you should clean the toilet? Your Ahankar will come down. In some of the spiritual things, you have to do things. So, Pranipatayana, falling at the feet, means you are shedding your ego. Without shedding ego, there is no learning. I am telling you, it is all wasting time. Today, it is full of ego and learning. That's why it is Tadviddi Pranipatayana. Pariprasnena. You can't keep quiet. You have to keep questioning. Questioning not in a very, you know, uh, disrespectful way. There is a genuine inquisitiveness with which questioning has to happen. Pariprasnena, sevaya. You have to, this working, this working for somebody and this uh, falling at the feet is all about if you don't shed your ego, there is no learning in life. All the learning they have done are aparavidya, they are not paravidyas. In Mundaka Ambrashan, there is something called paravidya and aparavidya. All that we are learning for our living are all imperfect knowledge which is all right. That doesn't take you uh, for your peace of mind. They are not guarantee, guarantee you peace of peace of mind is not your 250 brake loss for car. Peace of mind is not 50, 80 sight here I am telling you. Never. And some people learn it, understand it too. I am not saying don't get it, but don't think that's the one which is giving peace of mind, you have deep trouble. That's all I am trying to say. So all these are part of our, uh, you know, culture that we must, uh, you know, uh, have this larger perspective of life. It's not just in Bhagavad Gita. It's all in other texts also. I will quote one shloka and stuff, which is not from Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the texts 2000 years old. It says, Acharya Padam Adatte, Padam Sishya Somedeya, Padam Sabrimachari Bhyaha, Padam Kalakramena Cha. Learning is classified into four quarters. Padam in all Indian languages is quarter, one fourth. So, Acharya Padam, 25% learning comes from a teacher, whatever it means. 
padam shishya samedaya if you don't use your meda if you don't self reflect 25% khatam after mekalay's system of education the first thing that was stopped was self reflection i mean you can't run a society in which you start questioning because indian policemen must beat indians how can you question indian policemen must beat indian that's why this education system was made british ruled us 150 years before they went and the education system was made at that time the questioning frame of mind must be put down so meda must be discouraged in 1700 india's share of trade in the world india and china put together a share of trade was some 45% of global trade or 60% or some such number in 150 years we were completely looted of our raw material and today our share of trade is 1 and a half percent so it is not growth we are actually fallen we are learning to get up now since 17th century our share of trade in the global trade was 60 percent china and india put together today you know we are nowhere so some eight or five percent 25 percent padam sa brahmachari bhi this joke that you know there are the indian frauds you don't need a lead and all that is all you have to you know uh, take it very joke not jokingly very seriously because our ancestors say sad brahmachari bhi hai which means in a gurukul these brahmacharis must sit together and discuss group work in iim we do a lot of group work in management because that's the only way we know some amount of learning happens so padam sa brahmachari bhi hai 25% padam kalakramena learning is a lifelong experience is what in current paradigm of management in 5 years we are shouting this is 2000 years old they say 25% running happens forever so here is a wisdom ancient indian wisdom which is extraordinarily valuable and you know where we are now i will tell a story where we are now there is one poor man completely de- delibated hut and he is a pauper he doesn't know where is he is he doesn't even know how he will get his next food this is his situation little he knew that actually their ancestors buried several parts of gold below the floor so we, in the indian society is in that situation today we don't know that there is gold buried here we are all paupers we are looking around our begging for arms and so on we have a serious identity crisis we can change it and only way to change it is it is a personal experience you have to read you have to believe you have to develop shraddha you have to look at these texts make sense for yourself see the joy of what you are doing and enjoy what you are doing and have a contented life that is a goal it is not the number of cars and bank balance they will never give you any contentment while they may help a little bit real contentment is filling the heart and these are the examples these are the texts which entirely address how do you fill your heart so let us all fill our heart thank you